Well, hi there. Welcome to Unscripted and a happy, happy new decade. Happy 2020. I wish you all the very best. Um, may your plans come to fruition, but also as you wait, may you wait well. We're beginning this year with this episode talking about the beauty of waiting. Our guest is called Tabitha Kihara and she's here to share about this book and what it's all about. And I must share a verse that is in this book. It goes, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Isaiah 40, 31. Like I said, we start off the year with resolutions and plans, which is great. We must have a vision and a plan, but there'll be seasons of waiting. So Tabitha today is reminding us to wait well and be patient and wait on the Lord. Let's begin the show. Welcome to Unscripted with me, Grace and Salame. Special thanks to Parkin by Radisson for hosting us and the January sun. Let's begin. So we can begin by sharing who you are and um, yeah, what you do. Thank you. You're welcome. My name is Tabitha Kehara yeah. and I'm a writing coach and I know that. I've written this book about the beauty of waiting right. to encourage people to be fruitful and victorious in every season of waiting. Okay. Because waiting is, we all we'll go through seasons of waiting, but how do we wait? That's true. Yes, what is our attitude as we wait? And um, from your book, I was, first of all, I love that it's such an easy read. Thank you so much. I managed to finish it on uh, Ride Back Home, so thank you for that. Um, but some things are easier said than done. For you, um, what led to you writing about um, the beauty of waiting? What convicted you? I looked at my life mm. and um, I actually realized that I've gone through uh, various seasons of waiting. Mm. Uh, looking at my life from being born, I'm the eighth child uh, and my parents waited for 16 years to have me. So perhaps that informs my waiting. Oh, That's wow. what I actually thought. And now, uh, then looking at how I got, I dated my husband, we dated for four years before getting married. Oh, and then wow. we got married and waited for six years before having a baby. So wow. waiting has been an important aspect of my life. It so does. I thought, I've, I've learned so many lessons. I would like to encourage somebody about waiting, yeah. how to wait and wait well. What is your attitude as you're waiting? How did you do it? How did you build patience um, waiting? to get married, I'm sure even meeting your husband, yes. um, having a child. What has been your, your theme through it to see you through? It takes uh, a lot of patience, how did you do it? Yes, it takes a lot of patience, yeah. but uh, the most important thing is to know what exactly do you want and to even know that you have no control over your life. Mm. God eventually is the one who decides what happens, so you must wait and wait and waiting well. Okay. So for me, it was important for me to wait. I had what I would have wanted to happen, but I got to realize I have to wait for it to happen. Okay. Yes. So for you predominantly in this book, the main story is your journey of, to motherhood, um, trying to be a mother and being a parent. Um, so if you could take us back to the beginning of when that started for you and how it was. Okay. I got married in 2009, October 17th. Okay. And for the first year, like most couples, you want to have fun with your husband. Right. I mean, I'd, wait, I'd dated for four years. Exactly. And our love was raw and undefiled. And, and I so, like that you yeah. said that. Don't yes. rush to have kids. Enjoy each other. Yes. In the first year, at yes. least. Yeah. So we were happy to get married. Yeah. And so we said for the first one year, we want to have fun. We want to travel. We want to camp. We just want to know each other. Okay. And I kept thinking, I don't want my husband to know me with the morning sickness, mm. you know. I want to to be with him for one year, be happy, enjoy, yeah. and just settle in marriage. Okay. So we actually, so our, so our gynecologist who advised us on the best way to actually prevent having children. Oh. And for me, I would look at women and actually even think that you can get pregnant just by looking at a pregnant woman. <laughs> so we were using every means we knew to avoid getting pregnant. And so uh, our first year was good and we actually were this couple that many young people admired because mm. my husband was a youth leader and we were mentoring many young people in church. Okay. So our second year of marriage, uh, we began wanting to have a baby. Mm -hmm. And so the first few months we did not actually think about it when we didn't conceive. Then after six months we actually thought there could be a problem maybe. Okay. So we went to see our gynecologist. Mm -hmm. 
And so he said, we are going to go through several tests. Uh, we had the test, my husband had the test, and then they okay. said, okay, just keep trying, keep trying, we'll see what happens. I like that you said both of you were tested. Yes. Because you were here in situations where the woman, the pressure is all on her. Yes. And the man is not checked. So both of you went for the checkup. Yes. Oh, good. No, yeah, I yeah. I must say, I have a very supportive husband. Indeed. And he has worked with me throughout. And yeah. even when we'd go to see the doctor, he would be there oh. all the time, all the time. Okay. So we went with him and the doctors uh, advised us to have some tests checked and my husband was okay and the doctor said i think you're having some hormonal imbalance so he began to give me supplements and then he said just continue trying for a baby mm. so the second year passed nothing happened and the third year passed and wow. by that time now we are so starting to panic hormones. yeah supplements mm. we are trying mm. And we're seeing the gyna and now we've done many many tests because even the gynecologist is saying why don't you if i don't we check this why don't we check this yeah. but everything else seems to be okay so i'm still on supplements okay. we are trying to balance the hormones then the third year passed nothing had happened really? then the fourth year I eventually we realized that we were pregnant and we were excited. Oh, so yes. for, on the fourth year? On the got fourth pregnant. year, yes, uh -huh. we got pregnant and we were very, very happy. Okay. Ah, then sadly, so we went to see the, our gainer again mm -hmm. and he said after six weeks I want you to come back and then we see the progress. Going to him at, at six weeks, uh, there was no heartbeat. Yeah, so we were sad. We, we, we couldn't believe it. I mean, he had waited for this baby. How were you in that moment when you hear you've been trying for a child for yes. years and mm. then the time when you finally get a test? Yes. That's, in fact, how was that moment when the test showed positive? I was very happy. I was extremely you? excited. Oh my. And you can imagine by this time, I've been testing like almost every month. I'm testing really? to see whether I'm pregnant. For two years? Yes, for two years. And each time negative? Negative, yes. So you can imagine how excited I was. I called my husband when he came home in the evening. We actually tested together to just confirm. And we were so happy and we called our gyna and the following day we went to see him. And then he said, okay, let's, uh, you need to take some supplements as we progress. And then after six weeks, then we'll come have, for, yes, okay. come for a scan. So we went uh, and the scan, actually the gyna said, are you sure you're pregnant? Oh, no. Yeah, because the, cause the, there the was... The scan didn't show yeah, as if. Yeah, it didn't show as if. And actually the heartbeat was so low, extremely low actually, extremely mm -hmm. low. So the, but then the gyna said, ah, this is normal, it happens a lot, many women lose, get miscarriages. But I'm thinking, it's not normal. I mean, we waited exactly. for this baby. Exactly. Yes. How did you feel in that moment? I was so sad, I was sad. I was actually in denial, I was thinking, no, this can't be happening. No. Yes, I was very, I was actually in denial. Then the gyna said, no, the good thing is we've seen you can get pregnant. Yes. So we are going to try again, and, and that how, gave us hope. How did that go? Did you try again, and did you, were you successful? Oh, yeah. We actually now, uh, mm -hmm. the doctor advised we wait for a few months. Okay. And then we continue taking the supplement. Then the following year now, our fifth year, we tried. Okay. And I got pregnant again. Okay. And, and this time, time, we are happy and not happy, because, because now we are panicking. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And we are panicking. So we went to see the doctor, and he said, okay, looks like this time we are going to make it. Oh, yes. And... Um, so we go for the six weeks, uh, and the heartbeat is there, we are okay, mm -hmm. and then we are progressing. Uh, seven weeks now, we go back again because I'm beginning to feel like I'm having cramps. Yeah. So we are asking the doctor what At is happening. Weeks? That is seven weeks now. Mm -hmm. And the doctor says you need to do a scan. And now this time, the scan shows that there's a heartbeat, but the heartbeat is low. Mm -hmm. And the doctor says, so I, I'm telling the doctor, but at least uh, there's, a uh, there's a heartbeat, yes, yeah. we can, at least we can work with that. So the doctor says, okay, what you do is you, you'll go home and come back after 12 weeks and then okay. we'll be able to confirm how the state of the heartbeat. All right. So the doctor tells me I need to be on bed rest. So mm -hmm. I go home and I'm, and I'm on bed rest now for the next like three weeks. I see. Yes. And um, through the, while in your, I guess on bed rest for, for three weeks. Yes. Um, what did you do to... I guess remain positive or pass the time. What what did you do in that period? Yeah, that, that began another season of waiting. Yes, 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 yes. And that was a very important time for me because I was home. I was home alone. My mm -hmm. husband was away at work. I, I started reading books. I began reading the Bible. I actually read the Bible cover to cover. Oh, 
and as I was reading, I would look at uh, stories of women that had waited. Mm. And then I got to realize, you know what? There must be a war in the womb. It's not even about me. It's about these babies that are being that born. They are being fought because they have a calling, they have a destiny, they have a purpose. That's so true. what am I going to do as a waiting mom? Yeah. I have to begin to pray, not only to pray for myself, but even to pray That's for challenge. other women who are waiting for babies, who are carrying babies. I got to see the other aspect of it. It's about waiting and waiting well. So I began to read my Bible. I began to pray for myself and for other women who are waiting. And that is actually what built my relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I even got to realize, you know, sometimes the Lord will take you through situations yeah. where he wants to separate you. Because I was alone. My husband wasn't there. Yeah. So I had to hear the Lord for myself. Yeah. And I got to realize sometimes he'll take you to the wilderness so that he can speak tenderly to you. Absolutely. And that is what he did to me. I actually got calm, I got assurance that, you know what, whether this baby comes or not, I mean, I think what I need is the Lord. Because he gives you peace that surpasses your human understanding. Amen. And I think it's when we have nowhere else to look. Yes. And it's only God. Yes. That's when he speaks. Yes. And when we draw closer to him. Yes. But I like that in that season of mm -hmm. you praying for your child and mm -hmm. yourself, you thought about others. Yes. Tell me about that and why it's important to, when you're in your dark moment and going through your struggle, mm. you actually heal by helping others. Tell yes. me what, yes, what led you to that? And how? Oh, yeah. I got to realize, um, I, got, I actually got to realize many women had actually had miscarriages. And mm. then I got to ask myself, why is this happening? Mm. Then there must be more than what I can even see. So I, act I actually started even writing a book, a journal. Mm. A 40 weeks pregnancy journal where I was researching on what happens uh, during the first week of pregnancy okay. and then I would write a love letter to the unborn baby and I was to support it and then I said I'll be giving this to every woman who is pregnant who is my friend mm -hmm. as a support yes. to them and as I pray for them because I got to realize you actually can never possess what you don't honor mm -hmm. if you want to get pregnant begin supporting women who are mm -hmm. pregnant women who are also waiting for babies if you want mm -hmm. to get married begin supporting married people and praying for them. Oh. You cannot possess what you don't honor. It's and awesome. as you support others, you also find healing. You do. Yes. And how did that impact their lives, those you were helping? Yeah, they were very happy and of course looking at me and wondering, why would I even support them Imagine. when I look like I'm the person who needs to be supported? Yeah, yeah but for me it was nice. It was yeah, a it healing, was, it was a healing. therapeutic journey for you. Yes, it was. It um, was. And there are many women who've lost their young ones and miscarried. It's not an easy experience for any woman to go through um, and for you it was um, first of all so you had one miscarriage mm. this second child mm -hmm. you also miscarried at some point yes yes didn't you? yes I did you can tell us how that happened and how you dealt with going through a miscarriage not once but twice mm. uh, the first time I had the miscarriage um, somehow because it was the first one I was able to deal with it okay. and life moved on. and apparently that same year mm. my father was diagnosed with cancer stage 4 cancer oh, yeah. and so we were also busy taking care of him and then at the end of the year he passed and you were very on close with him. well from the yes. book I could tell you were very close yes I was a daddy's little girl you I'm were. the eighth born out of uh, eight children I'm so I was you. very very close to my father yeah. actually I am the kind of woman that I am today because of what I learned from my father because mm. he loved me so much yeah. he mentored me uh, so during the second loss mm -hmm. you can imagine now we've waited it's now about uh, seven weeks and I'm on bed rest yeah. up to 12 weeks and you're being very intentional you take yes. care of yourself yes so I'm happened? on bed rest so I'm not doing any work mm -hmm. And then I begin to feel pain. And this pain, I cannot even describe it because it's radiating from the back going to the head. So I call my guy and he says, I think you're having contractions. Oh no. It's like premature. labor. Yeah. yeah, premature labor. And so I call my husband and I tell him, I'm, on, I'm in so much pain, you need to come home. So he comes home and we rush to the hospital. By that time, I'm in a lot of pain. We get to the hospital and I'm put on a wheelchair. Wow, yes. Yes. And then Are I'm, you bleeding? Yes, I'm already not bleeding. Okay. I'm actually bleeding now. So we get to the hospital and first I'm injected because I'm in so much pain. And Let's then we see. are sent to do a scan. And now they confirm to us, we think you're losing this baby. Then I start, then when by you the way, those words, yes, I get into denial. I start yeah. asking the doctor, is it because what did I do? Did mm -hmm. I overwork myself? Is, you know, like now I'm in denial. Yes. 
I start asking myself, what, what is happening? Did I work too much? Did I follow the doctor's mm -hmm. advice? And then the doctor, and my husband is there. So my husband begins to explain to the doctor, uh, you know, she's been taking this medication for, you know, the supplement. Yeah. My husband was taking it so well. In fact, the doctor said, you need him. He's good oh, for you. Good. He's taking it so well. Because me, I'm in denial. I'm trying to find out what could I have done wrong. You're blaming yourself. I'm blaming myself. It's a thing we would do as, what would you tell a woman who is yes. blaming herself? Maybe she's had multiple miscarriages. Yes. What would you tell her right now? I would tell her, please don't blame yourself, because I did that. Actually, for me, I began to even feel I have actually lost the second pregnancy. Yeah. You know, Tabitha, you cannot even take care of an unborn baby. We live and take care of a born baby. You cannot even give your husband a baby. Yeah. You know, like I was feeling so sad. I was blaming myself. And I would mm -hmm. tell another woman, if you don't have support system, you can easily go through depression. That's true. Yeah, so don't blame yourself. You know, these things are, these are external factors that are beyond you. Yeah. And for me, what helped me is my trust in God, knowing that this has happened, I have no control. Mm -hmm. And number two, my husband, he was very supportive. I always say we are better together. And mm -hmm. I advise couples, support each other. You're yeah. better together, especially when you're going through a hard time like a miscarriage mm -hmm. or trusting God for babies yeah. or trying to conceive. You are better together. Indeed. Yes. Thank you so much for that. I think we'll take a short break. We'll be right back with more from Tabitha. Stay tuned. Parking by Edison for hosting us today and even moving us away from that hot sun. Isn't it hot? Yes. Yes, this is January for you, but we are grateful all the same. Um, let's continue the conversation, Tabitha. Um, like I said earlier in the book, at some point I read that you encouraged women to talk about their journey, um, though it's a very hard one to go through. Um, but for you, why is having a conversation about it important in healing? This conversation is important mm -hmm. uh, because as you begin to talk about it, you realize you're not the only person going through it. Yeah. You get to share with other women and you encourage each other. So I advocate, I actually encourage women to, to speak out. Mm -hmm. And if you can't speak out, then write it out. Indeed. Yeah. How is, how is writing being therapeutic for you? Oh, writing helped me a lot. Okay. I actually remember uh, when I lost the second baby, I began writing letters to God and I would ask him tough questions. I would actually ask him, why do you give babies to, what, what do you use to qualify who to give babies to? What do I need to do so that I get a baby? You know, I would ask him tough questions, questions that you cannot even ask anybody. Mm -hmm. And for me, that brought healing. Because the moment you begin to write it down, yeah. you, do do? yes, it encourages you and you begin to connect with it. Okay. Yeah, so for me, I encourage people to speak about it okay. and also write it out. But um, through it all, what would you say was your darkest moment through the whole experience? My darkest moment was uh, losing the second pregnancy because mm -hmm. that was at 12 weeks and you can imagine I had connected with that pregnancy. Mm -hmm. I'd begun thinking you about... More hopeful. I was more hopeful. Yeah. And actually they say at 12 weeks you're almost feeling safe. Yeah. And so I'd began to connect with the baby, I'd began to shop, I'd began to imagine oh, being shocked. a mother. I'd began, I, I was imagining my husband being a doting father. You can imagine. Yeah what happened now how yeah. did you deal with um, the losses uh, for me um, first uh, I want to say like I had said earlier my husband was always there for me system. yeah he okay. was such a good support system and also prayers I began to pray and also began to feel that everything happens for a reason yeah. and then I began to write the more I wrote the more I found healing mm -hmm. yeah and I like how you're very candid in this book and even talk about how <clears throat> sorry intimacy between you and your husband became mm -hmm. more of a task you know you check the clock it's I'm ovulating it's time to take us through that process of a woman who's trying to conceive desperately how was your state of mind then I must say trying to conceive is not easy mm -hmm. that period can be challenging and now you can imagine you're working with your doctor yeah. and so you're even using the ovulation calendar and Imagine. so for you those days are very important yeah. so you're waiting for every minute Imagine. you you can't wait to see your husband and you're thinking you have to you, you need to have it done yeah. every day counts yeah. so for you sex sex is no longer fun so you're having it because it's a project and you're actually you. thinking i'm hoping this time we arrest the eggs and we get a baby yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's not easy. It's not. And yeah. so you keep thinking, I'm hoping that I'm not shortchanging my husband. Right. Yeah, so you're hoping that he's also in the process. Did, yeah. you, did you have a conversation with him? Did you guys talk about it? Yeah, we'd talk about Good. it and he would keep saying, no, let's just have it for fun. The baby will come when it's time. And actually mm -hmm. for him, he actually was easy. Okay. And he kept thinking, there's no hurry. Actually for him, he kept saying, um, we need to do so many other things. Let's have our life, let's enjoy because babies will eventually come. Yes. And actually he kept feeling, if you're not yet 10 years in marriage then, we still have time. Okay. He was more hopeful. So what we discussed earlier during the break, sometimes this pressure is self-imposed, isn't it? Yes. As women, um, yes. waiting to get married, waiting to have a child, mm -hmm. and even society puts that pressure on women. Yes. As you grow older, what mm. are we asked? Oh, so when is the wedding? Um, when is a baby or when is the next baby coming? Yes. How did you handle that pressure within yourself? You giving yourself and having that desire and hearing from other people, You're going to a baby shower. How did you handle all those moments while we were waiting? Initially, um, I would feel sad and I would mm. keep feeling, why is it that everybody is getting babies and not me? Yeah. And then I would feel again sad because I'm not happy for my friends. And then I realized, you know what? You, because they keep getting invited for baby showers and yeah. bridal showers. Yeah. And actually, even in church, I help in organizing them. I realized, you know what? I have to be happy for the other person. True. Like I said earlier, what you don't honor, you don't possess. But of course, it was never easy. Yeah. And, but I would encourage anybody waiting for a baby, learn to support the others who have babies. Yeah. yeah. It's in supporting them that you learn something and find your healing isn't yeah it? and even when you get your own baby then you've learned some lessons yeah okay so it's helpful all the same it's helpful um and how did your because like i said before it's difficult to hear from men mm -hmm. how did your husband deal with that journey and as a couple how did you both overcome uh, my husband like i said is very supportive and there are people who would ask him about the babies, especially people who were very significant to him. And he kept telling them, you know what, uh, if anything happens, I'll let you know. And then he would mm -hmm. always say, uh, you know, we, 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 we are here for companionship. He had a way of just dealing with it. Okay. Yeah. And I think it was easier for him. Really? But in, eventually, after the baby had come, yeah. Uh, I saw a journal he had written and then he had talked about how he met a friend of his in the supermarket oh. one day and this person asked him how many babies do you have and he said none and the person began giving him advice and the person was saying you know for me I got married after you and we already have three babies oh what is happening babies are good and so he kept I think he was also dealing with it but course, dealing with it well good. Yeah, I think he was more concerned about me. Um, so, yeah, so he dealt with it quietly in his own yes. way as well. Yes. How do you encourage other husbands who are waiting for their miracle? What would you tell them? I would tell them to, be? to encourage the women and to work with them. Uh, if you're going to see the doctor, go together with them, pray for them. Just show them that you're in this together and no blame games. No blame no games. Blame games. Yes. Let's talk about that blame game. How did you... Did you blame yourself? Did he blame himself? And how did you deal with it? We didn't blame each other. Good. Actually, we were very sensitive when talking about it. Good. And he actually said he wanted to support me. He wanted to do all the tests the doctor would ask him to do Good. just to make sure he was OK. And he would be with me all the time. And the guy now we were seeing was quite a busy person. Mm. So we'd see him at night, at 10 in the night. And my husband what? would be there <laughs> every time I went to see him. Okay. And even when the baby came, he was there the entire time. He actually took leave. He was home for two months. He's the one who oh, cleaned wow. the baby the entire two months. Oh, wow. He was very extremely supportive. And it's very important for a husband to support the wife, That's especially really. when you're trying to conceive. And also raising the young one. That's true. Yes. That's that's true. Mm. I like how you mentioned he, how intentional he was yes. when baby came. Mm. Um, I think in sometimes in life we don't realize there are lessons to be learned in waiting. Mm -hmm. you, maybe you would not been, we would not have been as intentional as a father yes. if he hadn't waited yes. that long yes. for for his son. Yes. Um, so what would you tell a woman at home who is waiting for her miracle? What would you tell her now? As you're waiting. Um, don't let what you're waiting for define you. Your life needs to move on. Like for me, when I was waiting, mm. I began to write. That's how I actually got to realize that I love writing. I so see. I began to write. I began to support other women. And I got involved in my church. Okay. 
Yes, yeah, so uh, and I went back to school and did a master's in IT. Well so done. like your life has to move on. Don't let this external factor define you That's true. and confine you to feeling so bad about yourself. Your life has to move on yeah. Yeah, as you wait. So the your attitude, gift. yes, att attitude is very important. Yeah. Discover your purpose. And move on. And move on. Yeah. Though easier said than easier said than done sometimes, no? Yes. Yeah? What gave you the strength to do it? Like I said, I think it's my trust in God. Because at some point, especially when we lost the second pregnancy, and you can imagine I'd been on bed rest for almost five weeks now. The doctor actually said it was important for us to be away because yeah. now he thought we are going to go back home. I've been home for that period. And the doctor kept feeling like I would go through depression if we didn't, if we went back home. Okay. So he advised that we take a short vacation and we went to Sabo East National Park and we were there for one week. And while there, we also took time to pray. And I remember praying and really feeling like the Lord was giving me rest on this matter. Really? It's like I felt like he was saying, you know, whether the fig tree blossoms or not, I'm still God. Mm. For me, my trust in God is what made me move on. Okay. And, I, and I began to realize, you know what, I have no power. It's God who gives and he takes away. That's and even true. when he gives me, it's him who is in charge. Amen. I have to allow him to be in control. So I would advise anybody who is waiting, don't let the situation define you. Yeah. Just leave it to God and do your part. I love as you finish up this part in this book, predominantly, um, the theme is yes, waiting on, on motherhood or having a child, mm. but it's about your faith in God. Mm -hmm. Tell me about how that is, if you can take about your faith with us, but mm -hmm. also how it's grown through this journey. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, being a last born out of eight, I really never had any serious challenges in, in life. Really? This seems to, to have been my most uh, trying period. Okay. And I got to learn how to pray. I got to learn how to seek the Lord for myself. I, I began see. to pray and to even hear from the Lord, like reading the Bible cover to cover. Yeah. So what I advise is, even as you're waiting for what you really desire, have a personal relationship with the Lord, have an intimate relationship with the Lord, okay. speak to him, know he's your father, he can speak to you and you can hear when he speaks. Yeah. And of course, your attitude has to be right. You can't be complaining, you cannot have a Indeed. bitterness. Indeed. Yeah, so you have to actually know it's going to happen when the time is right. Let's take a short break now and uh, as we try and deal with this sun we'll be right back in a few minutes stay tuned Tabitha let's get away from the sun um, as we're going tell me um, this book um, it's about waiting and the beauty of waiting and you've shared some very many we can stay here in the shade mm -hmm. some many key lessons um, what have been the biggest that you can highlight today on the show my biggest lesson has been on uh, being fruitful and victorious. As you're waiting, yeah. uh, you have to make sure that you, you're fruitful. Okay. Your life has to move on mm. and be victorious. Yeah. Empower the people, inspire the people, and also motivate them. And also um, look back at where you're coming from. Mm. We have a heart full of gratitude. Yes. Thank God. Just because one thing is not working doesn't mean that everything else is not working. Amen. Even being alive is something. Something to be grateful for. Yes. In yes. fact, as they say, the more grateful you are, the more you attract miracles into your life. Very and true. You've, you've listed a very lengthy and powerful, there's a passage in you, but I think as you finish the book, mm -hmm. um, tips on how to share gratitude. Mm -hmm. Kindly share. People need to know at home before they buy the book. Tell, take us through it. Yes. Uh, like what I do in the morning, yeah. I wake up in the morning as I'm having my morning routine yeah. and I list down what I want to do during the day okay. and I begin to thank God for even the light, even for, for waking up in the morning, being healthy, yeah. you know, I begin to appreciate God for everything yeah. and then I begin to, to plan for the day. Whatever you go through is for a purpose, okay. don't waste your pain, that's I what see. I say. So you tell that to yourself and you write it down? Yes, I say oh, I'll wow. not waste my, my pain. This day, yeah. I must uh, achieve what I'm meant to achieve. Okay. So it doesn't matter what I'm going to go through, I'm not going to waste any pain that I'll go through. All right. Yeah. But most important is I have to be fruitful throughout the day. Okay. Yes. And there are other things you, if I could go back, I thought they were quite powerful. It was almost a whole chapter taking us through, and your pictures are very cute, by the way. 
Yes, practical ways of showing gratitude. Uh huh. Yes, you listed about how many? About four of them. If you could take us, yeah. So there's the notes that you uh -huh. do in the morning. What else? Yes, yes, yes. I do the notes. Um, after writing down my notes, um, I make sure I list down exactly what I want to do during the day. Mm. It's also important to have a plan. Mm. Because when you have a plan, you begin to get focused. Mm. And um, also looking at other people and thinking, how can you inspire them is very important for me. Okay. And also having a, a gratitude, like I have a gratitude jar every day. At the end of the day, I list down what, what was I able to achieve and then I put it in the gratitude jar. Great. It's very important for me. And I like how, and I quote, this is good because, or it could have been worse. Tell me about that. Yes. Uh -huh. um, of course, when you go through issues, you keep thinking, this is the worst that could have been. I know. Imagine it could have been worse. Yeah. For me, I keep saying, if you're still alive, then there is hope. Indeed. Oh, he's not gone. Indeed. Yeah, so for me, that is very important. Okay. It could have been worse, but it's not worse because I'm alive, so there's still hope. Indeed. Yeah. And also, I have another book here, which apparently came from your desire to help others, and you formed a writing club. Tell me about that before we discuss this book. Tell me about the writing club. Yes. And how uh, it came to be. Like I said earlier, uh, one of the ways of dealing with what I was going through was writing and journaling. Yeah. And then I got to realize probably the reason why I didn't go through depression was because I would write a lot. Okay. Like I said, I would write letters to God and I would ask him tough questions. Yeah. And then I realized after I got the baby, did how you many feel before you continue, did you feel like you got answers to those questions? He does answer. Good. Yes, because okay. most of the things, the questions I would ask him, I would actually find answers. Oh good. Yes. That would give you peace? They would give me a lot of peace. Okay. And then I got to realize then if this worked for me, it could work for another woman especially. Okay. So in 2018, yeah. I actually began a WhatsApp group and I invited people. I actually said, are you going through an issue? Would you like to know how to write and tell your story? Where, where did you share this? In WhatsApp, in different WhatsApp groups. Oh, okay. And I got so many people joining. Oh, wow. So I called it Mapo Group Writers. Okay. So so many women and even men joined. Wow. And then I began to teach them how to write and I they see. were excited. And then we began having monthly oh, meetings. Really? And eventually we decided, why don't we come up with a book? So we just released our first book, a short is. stories. I don't know which camera I should show it to. So how many, how many people joined the group? Uh, around uh, 250 people joined the group. And how many people wrote it? 15 people. I actually called for a call of short stories and I got wow. so many of 100 short stories. So I had oh, to wow. use editors to, because we were looking at getting 20 stories. Okay. So we had to come up with 20 stories out of the 100 received wow. and then work on them. And then eventually we released a book. Help Next Door. Tell me about this title. What is the book about? The theme was uh, writing about impact. How have you impacted somebody else? Okay. So those are that, the stories are about impact. So it's from wow. 15 writers. They all gave their personal stories of Amazing. how somebody has impacted them or Amazing. how they have impacted somebody else. Oh, wow. And through that experience, what has the feedback been from those who joined the group and started writing because of you? How has it impacted their lives? They've been very happy. In really? fact, most of them even have released their own books and most of them have said they Look found healing through writing. Well done. Because people are able to speak out, they're able to talk about their pain. Because well I keep done. telling them, don't waste your pain. Well done. Let it inspire somebody else. Look at that. Yeah. And now I must say as we close up this part, you're a mother. Yes. You have a son. Yes. Tell us when that came to be, how it happened, and how is he? Oh, yeah. Now I'm a mother. I have a son called David Baraka. Uh -huh. And even naming him uh, took time. We had to pray about the name because we wanted yeah. our son to... We, we know he's a son of destiny. Yeah. He has a big purpose and calling. Yeah. So I got pregnant in January 20, 2015 I see. and October we got the baby. Okay. He's now four years, he's already in school. Congratulations. Yeah, and we're happy, we're excited parents. What kind of boy is he? Tell me about Baraka. Oh, he loves the Lord, he loves reading, he's already reading the Bible. You showed me pictures, I couldn't believe it. Yes, Aww. we've actually encouraged him to keep reading. So well what done. we do in That's the morning. That's a good habit. Yes, we leave books all over the house. When he wakes up in the morning, he'll begin to read. Mm. He can already tell Bible stories. It's interesting. What Parenting is fun. It is. It is fun. What, what does motherhood mean to you, considering everything that you've gone through? For me, I look at motherhood as... Um, 
as a gift from God. The Bible says children are precious gifts. Amen. So I look at this boy as a gift from God. Amen. And God will ask me how I raised him. Amen. So I take it like a responsibility. Okay. I want to do my best because I'll be answerable to God. Indeed. Yes. And so I keep praying that the Lord will give us an enabling environment to be able to raise him to achieve his purpose and destiny in God. Well done. Mm. As we finish up, I would like you to speak to the woman at home who has learned and it's confirmed that she cannot carry a child. Mm -hmm. What would you tell her today? I would advise this woman, there are many ways of getting children. She can even adopt because God is the one who decides what happens. Maybe God will not give you your own child, but will want you to be a child to somebody else's child. Mm -hmm. So I would say take it with gladness and um, just take care, of, take care of that child. Yeah. Yeah. Thank and inspire you. other children also. Pray okay. for other children. As you pray for yours, also tell the Lord, I'm praying for a million other children out there. Amen. Yes. I love your big heart, um, your disposition with everything that you've been through. Your light shines through. Thank you for being a light, Tabitha, for coming on the show and sharing your story. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for watching. This has been your favorite show, Unscripted. I believe it has. Happy New Year once again. Thank you so much for tuning in, for staying with us. We appreciate your viewership always and looking forward to walking this journey with you this year. Special thanks to Parking by Radisson for hosting us. And uh, let's enjoy the January